yet this novel reflects the ex author's Zionist interests as an American Jewish novelist. Yes. Could you please elaborate on that? How does Roth, Philip Roth, you know, propagate this Zionist thinking? Well, uh, if you uh, if you have a uh, closer look at the quotation here, yeah. you'll find that uh, um, it deals with Kurt Noy as, Amer as an American Jew who has achieved a lot of so social ascendancy in the American uh, uh, society. That, um, yet, we have here Oh yes. Well, uh, yeah, th this paragraph here goes to uh, page number 83 because yeah. after it, I am talking about Naomi. Yeah. His yeah. relation with Naomi. I'm talking about his relation with Naomi because and this is what I hinted to right yeah. in the middle of yeah. the, uh, the novel. No, but but why? I mean, clearly you said here Fort Knoll has already achieved a lot when it comes to social ascendancy. So what? Why is he suffering? I mean, what kind of suffering? What kind of identity problem does he have if he already has achieved the, you know, the material success? The material success because yeah. if you look at, uh, at right at the middle, at the end of the page here, mm -hmm. uh, the third line from the bottom, mm -hmm. he is the assistant commissioner of the City of yeah. New York Commission on Human Opportunity. And he is a celebrity. Exactly. In the novel, he has achieved that social ascendancy, societal ascendancy, and he is a celebrity. He is a very famous person. He is rich. Yet, he cannot marry a, Jew, a Jewish woman. In fact, he is on the uh, look for, on the search for junk sex. Mm. That's why all his sexual relations are with non Jews. Mm. So, there is that kind of ambivalence. There is that, that kind of Grievancy in his character. Mm. While he is very famous in public life, exactly. and his own personal life, he is a failure. Mm. Maybe and probably because of this psychological problem with the mother figure. With the mother figure. Really, that is, I mean, because it's not, it's no longer the tension between achieving material success and keeping the Jewishness. Yes. Really, the source of his problem is the mother and figure. This, this is what the, the novel says, because mm. a large part of it tells you about the, the way his mother wrote him, mm. how obsessive she was, yeah. and keeping him clean, and making him the best and the nicest Jewish boy who ever lived. Mm. This is what she said. And she even thought of him as... Um, uh, the best boy. Best. Yeah, he said something like that. Okay, and then you went on to this, you know, a Zionist message, uh, you know, when he meets the girl from Israel and so on. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, Ahmed, let me ask you a good question here. I have a problem with the division of your chapters, or maybe the title of your chapters. I can't really see a big difference between chapters two and three. It's really more or less the same idea of the vindictiveness of Jewish men who conduct sexual relations, sexual perversion with non-Jewish women. And it's, you know, this vindictive attitude towards women. So, what is the difference between the two chapters? The, 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 the difference between the two chapters here. In the second chapter, I have been dealing with misogyny. Mm. I, I, I have elaborated the idea of misogyny against the mother mm. or the material figures in the first chapter. In the second chapter, I'm dealing with his hatred for all women, either they are Jewish or non-Jewish. Mm. Yet, to study misogyny is, very, uh, is a very difficult project because we are studying a human feeling. Mm. We cannot define what misogyny is because we cannot define what love is. Yet, there are some symptoms of that love of hatred. Mm. One of the symptoms of that misogyny is the Jewish men's libido femininity, mm. their ever growing and ever existent desire to dominate women, especially when they are non Jews. Mm. And they dominate them, actually, subjugate them with the aim of taking vengeance against the non-Jewish society. Yes, they have achieved a lot of social ascendancy, a lot of success, yet they are in the limbo between their past and present. And that's why they they humiliate these non-Jewish uh, females. And this is what the third chapter shows. 
in the fourth chapter, I'm dealing with self-centeredness because it is one of the symptoms of that misogyny again. I am subjected, or the Jewish protagonists here are subjected in their viewpoint regarding the women characters and the female characters, and this is again a sort of misogyny, or a form of misogyny. Mm. Okay. Okay, Ahmed. Uh, chapter 4, I have really a big problem with chapter 4, yes. because most, or many, I would say, many of the quotations in chapter 4, and a couple of ideas, are taken from previous chapters. I think this is a serious problem. For example, a quote on page 114 is repeated again on page 10. And again, a quote on page 114 repeated on page 12. Page 57 is almost all repeated on page 122. Page 62, 125. Page 61 repeated on page 126. 62, 127, 26, 131. I can give you that later. And for example, there is one quote which uh, has been repeated three times. Yes. I remember this idea of Fort Norris racism and sexual relations with non-Jews. It was repeated page 84, 64, and 29. Again, the quote of uh, Alexander, uh, you know, um, when he visited his Christian girlfriend's bathroom, repeated That's three right. times. That's right. And there was a quote which was repeated four times, the description of Katie's house. You know, Katie was really a little bit disorganized and, you know, was repeated four times, page 34, 81, 116, 120. Even though if you want to repeat the idea that you can't really take a whole code, what, you know, you, you end up with chapter four really becoming fragments, bits and pieces from what was previously said. Well, I have my own reasons. Yeah. And they are very plausible reasons. The proofreading the, the pieces here more than three times or so, I thought about that question, and it's a very good question indeed. Yet, if you took, take into consideration the limited existence of the female characters in the novels of Saul Pellegrin, how they are marginalized, how they play very minor roles in the two writers' fiction, you'll find that coating them and recoating them again is very pleasurable because each single chapter is developing an ideology, and these quotations are very important to support these ideas and ideologies. Take, for example, uh, Joseph's attitude towards his wife, Iva. And by the way, Iva has been explained by uh, uh, some of the critics here as, I have a wife. So his attitude towards Iva is very misogynist, and he is a person who wants to, he doesn't like her, his wife's mentality. He doesn't believe in the way he, she thinks. She is a woman incapable of taking decisions. This is what he thinks about her. And that's why I made reference, and I choose the quotation that, she has, that says that Iva has her own likes and dislikes, and she was woman before we, we get married. Yet I'm using the same quotation here in, page, I mean, uh, chapter 4, because it gives you the idea of how self-centeredness Joseph is in speaking about his wife actually he is describing her. She's a woman who doesn't have her, 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 uh, her ability to decide on things. She has her own likes and dislikes, and she doesn't like that. So the, 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 the repetition of the quotations here is, in a way, acceptable if, we, if you take into consideration the limited, very limited existence of the female characters. In well, the I'm afraid Ahmed, I, I understand your reason, but I don't quite agree because First of all, you could have added more novels, you know. I checked the bibliography of both writers. They both have written novels. And I remember I looked quickly at the trilogy by Philip Roth. Yes. I would imagine that trilogy would have really sort of enriched your pieces. And again, even though if you don't even want to add more novels, I mean, you could have just mentioned the examples, you know, refer to the examples rather than repeating the whole quote. Yes. Because I can't imagine, Ahmed, you need to repeat the quote four times. I mean, really read the pieces later, and you will feel as a reader, you know, distance yourself from it. You will feel that as a reader, it's too much reading. Yes, so I'm afraid I don't quite agree. That's Think what, about it and see if you could maybe read the pieces. Yes, the, pieces. the other novels here, mm -hmm. I mean, why, why I didn't choose other novels, why mm -hmm. to both of here. If you go to the, um, the, the dates of the publications of mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the novels, and why these novels in particular, mm -hmm. you'll find that 
Sotelo wrote his first book, Goodbye Columbus, um, sorry, Dangling Man, in 1944, mm. just at, in the aftermath of World War II, the end of World War II. Yet, Philip Roth, on the other hand, was writing, uh, started writing Goodbye Columbus, which was published in 1959, which means 15 years after Sotelo wrote his first book. Yet, there is Salt of the Second Novel, The Victim, in 1947, and Portnoy's Complaint, in 1967, there is a... Yeah. That's right. So there are 20 years or more time gap between them. And this, if you, if you are going to speak about the thematic disparities between the two writers, mm -hmm. this, this gives you the idea why I choose these novels in particular. Philip Roth's novels, the first novels, his early novels, they were not given um, uh, much critical attention when they appeared. Even uh, it was the people who started writing about their these two early novels uh, after 20 years. And Sotil himself calls Danny Man his masterpiece and the victim his PhD. Yet there is no critical insight of the misogynists or the misogyny theme or in them. And uh, Sotelo deals with themes just like the victimization of the Jewish people uh, in the aftermath of World War II and the social alienation of the Jewish people. On the other hand, Philip Roth in Goodbye Columbus, which is a kaleidoscopic presentation of Jews in them in their past and present, and the Portnoy's complaint, which is very expressive of how uh, how psychologically these people are uh, are in a limbo indeed between their past and present. You'll find that Philip are is dealing with themes that are quite different. He is dealing with the Jewish people's entitlements, whether they are going to be Jewish, Orthodox Jewish, or to achieve societal ascendancy and merge and submerge in the, into the American society. So this thematic disparity, as well as stylistic disparity, was the reason why I chose these novels in particular. Yes. But couldn't you have maybe uh, traced the same stylistic and thematic uh, aspects in later novels? Wouldn't that have added? Sure. Uh, I, would, I don't know. I haven't read the trilogy, but I would think that the trilogy might really have given you some perspective. Sure. Did he change? Did he... Did I, I, I thought of that. I uh, thought of that. Yes, indeed. I mm -hmm. thought of that. Yes. Uh, when I um, take, for example, Philip Roth's Deception, Mm -hmm. written after his uh, breakup with his wife, mm -hmm. you know, the actress Claire Bloom. The man here, I mean Philip Roth, is changing his style, mm -hmm. he's changing his themes, yet there is a linkage, that's why I chose these mm -hmm. four novels, there is a linkage between them, which is that stylistic and thematic spirit as well as there is a linkage between them it has to do with the misogyny of mm. these children. Yeah, I, I would think, especially when you know, I think we refer to one of the novels in the, in the trilogy. That's uh, right. I Married the Communist, I think, or something? No, I Married the Communist was written by Philip Roth after he broke up with Claire Blue. But I think this is part of the what they call his trilogy. No. It is. Are you sure? No. I think he has three novels called trilogy. One of them is I Married the Communist. And a couple of more, but I don't remember the name. Well, the, uh, the, the trilogy here is um, um, Professor, they, they call it the Trilogy of Desire. Mm. The Professor of Desire, then there is the Breast, there is uh, uh, Deception, I think. Mm. Okay, deception. anyway, you're the expert anyway. Okay, Ahmed, yes. So, think of probably maybe for PhD or something, because what about Bello? Has he written, I mean, what's his latest novel? Bello, is it? Uh, it's, uh, uh, yes, uh, it's not as prolific, I think, as well. It is uh, December's Dean. December's Dean. Which was published in? Published in 19... Um, uh, uh, it is in the, uh, in the 80s, I think. Uh, I have, uh, uh, actually, mm. I have been searching on the internet mm. a lot of these mm. people. Mm. Really, but I think his latest novel is December's Dean. It was written mm. in the 80s, but mm. exactly. Mm. I don't know. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ahmed. Anyway, apart from this uh, problem with the chapter, uh, I have just a very quick comment about the self-centeredness. It's a suggestion, really, rather than a question. 
I don't know, maybe you should have really dealt more in this chapter with the different narrative techniques that both writers used. Maybe you should have gone into narration versus focalization. You know, uh, who sees and who speaks. And the idea of the uh, confessional memoir, because that's a very famous, you know, genre, you know, where you give one person authorial, you know, uh, voice or give him that voice and see what kind of, because it becomes really the only way where this person or this protagonist sort of uh, makes sense of his trauma. This is a very famous technique, so maybe you should have gone more into the technicalities of confessional memoir. Also, you, you mentioned the autobiography, but I'm afraid you haven't really made use of it. You know, maybe you should have also focused on this blurred boundary between memoir, between fiction, and the autobiography. I mean, there are lots of things that you could have really thought about in, in, in chapter four. Concerning the... the uh, chapter four in particular. Concerning the autobiography. That's one of the things, but I mean, more importantly is the idea of narrative techniques. The fictional memoirs, you know, because that's a very thing. I think this is what Roth and Beno have been doing, you know. They are using this very famous uh, memoir form, they sometimes call it fiction memoir, where they give a voice to male author, a male protagonist or female sometimes. They, they are themselves reincarnated. It, exactly, and then, you know, the, the boundary between fiction and reality is really blurred. That's right. So maybe you could have gone more into these things. Uh, I mean, well, professional I mean, narrative is, 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 is really a very famous genre. Maybe you could have dealt with it more. Um, well, I guess, I think it's better. Um, well, but I think this should be uh, more than enough. And, uh, I mean, maybe one final question. Would you agree with me that Roth and Bello have been denying non-Jewish voices, not really only women? I think their novels deny any non-Jewish voice, not only women voices. That's why. Would you think that that's from their conclusion? This is what the fourth, mm. the fourth chapter does. Mm. They are self-centered, mm. they are ego-ridden. Mm. They are Jewish, mm. and they think of Jewish people. Mm. And no one else is given the chance to speak for mm. the Jewish people, yeah. either the Jewish male protagonist mm. or the Jewish male creator. Yeah. This is exactly, because not only women. I think they are denying all, you know, non you know, we are very yeah. subjective, yeah. very subjective, very mm. partial. Mm. And uh, uh, I, I made that uh, note of Einar Curtis, and he is an Hungarian mm. Jew who won the Nobel Prize this year. Mm. And again, his masterpiece is famous. It deals mm. with his own experience mm. as young Jew mm. in the concentration camps for yeah. And And if you are, um, uh, if you take into consideration Anna Frank, Anna Frank mm. is. She's, she's very famous. Yeah, very famous. She's turned it into yeah. a, a, a movie. movie. Yeah. Very famous movie. And, and Anna Frank herself, I don't know if she is a real Yeah, so person say she's, 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 she's fiction, fiction, really. So again, they are very self-centered. Yeah. yeah, but I think it, it's also part of the tradition of this confessional narrative or confessional memoir. So maybe you could have added or linked between this idea of self-centeredness and the form that they use. Because by the way, for Jewish American authors, this is a very famous form, this confessional narrative. Like you said, the guy who won the Nobel Prize has used it. Okay, thank you very much, Ahmed. This was a very good thesis. I wish you good luck, inshallah, for this thesis and the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Leila, for a very enlightening, illuminating, interesting uh, discussion as usual. Uh, I always expect that from you. And uh, thank you, Ahmed. You were correct. Uh, may I now call the Professor Sarah Rashwan to examine the candidate? Thank you. Now, before we start, Ahmed, I just want to ask you a very simple question. Why don't you sit down? Yes, I thought there was no chair, and I found a chair, and you are sit down now. You're not short, I mean, you're torn up, you can see it. Now, you can see it. 
the side of how the clash between the, the mother and the aunt, two maternal figures. The aunt is sort of Americanized. She has achieved that social and cultural relation to the American society. She is Americanized. Modernized. Modernized and Americanized. While the, the, the mother here, on, on the other hand, is clenching past to the Jewish heritage, to the Jewish past. She wants him to read uh, the, about, uh, the, 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 she wants him to read in the Talmud. She wants him to have a pastor hair, uh, a brown haircut. She mm -hmm. wants him to preserve the Jewish heritage and Jewish past. To keep to the traditions. That's it. But in the death scene here, the aunt throws herself on the mother's dying body and she separates him physically from his aunt. So this scene here visualizes to some extent the separation, the separation between the mother and the aunt. Yet the, the, the aunt here is represented as more powerful than the, his mother herself. His mother herself. Yes. That because the mother here is crying in one of uh, the, the scenes and she is dying. So she is weak, weaker than the aunt herself. Okay. <coughs> to which side does soul battle belong, past or present? In the Kush, does he follow the, is he on the side of the past culture, or does he side with the present modern attitude? Well, if we are going to talk about soul battle himself mm -hmm. as a Jewish man, an American Jewish mm -hmm. man, Yet there is that ambivalence, even in himself, as mm -hmm. an ordinary Jewish person, between his past and present. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have here in my head James Atlas's autobiography, mm -hmm. and it's very incisive, mm -hmm. very informative, because it tells you a lot about Sokol himself, the man himself. Uh, Sokol's mother died when he was just yeah. young, and the mother herself was a very minute observant of the Jewish Heritage is Jewish past. So Sokol himself had suffered from that kind of uh, ambivalence towards his Jewishness. So he attacked both. He no, he's not attacking both. He is just like his protagonists. Yes, I mean, but he doesn't side. He doesn't side because has. he is, uh, in a way, um, 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 he is he's ambivalent about himself, about his Jewishness. He cannot side with the past and he cannot. Yes, he's in a dilemma in a conflict. Yes. He is just like his protagonist. Okay. Now, what about the relationship between Joseph and Brenda? Joseph and Brenda. Oh, yes, this is. Oh, yes, I no. know. It is going to be male, not. But it is. I'm sorry, it is misprepped. Okay. Now, in the work of the conversion of the Jews, where is the hatred? Where is the abhorrent action? I want you to pinpoint it. Well, the hatred here, well, thematically, the short story of version of the Jews mm -hmm. is about the way a young child, a young Jewish child, rebels against the mythology, the mythology of his rabbinical teacher. Mm -hmm. He rebels against his one, against, I'm sorry, against his mother, who is preserving the Jewish past. And there is the, uh, the event of tension, which is given to the way she prays. Yes. Her prayer, she is performing something for the child, despite an occult. Which he can't understand. Uh, he cannot understand it. And he is very sarcastic about it. He, he, is, he, does not, he does not believe in it. He does not believe in it as a biblical teacher. Mm -hmm. and that's why at the end of the novel, he makes everyone in the street kneel to him and repeats whatever he wants to say. And this is, gives you the idea of the conversion of the Jew. What, what does it represent? What does it say? Now, do you think that the hatred is due to religious prejudice as being a Christian or a mere dislike? This is on page 22. 22, the final vote and the last driver. This hatred 